raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bottle said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, spanning the serpentine coils of ancient earthworks throughout the ancient Americas. Joining me, as always, right here as we pony up and pour our favorite dark brew, James Waldo and Jason Pintrail. Mr. Pintrail, how are you there, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. You know, I'm really excited about the show tonight. It's been a while since we've been on the mic. You've been doing some traveling, and I'm happy to be back here with both of you gentlemen, and I'm ready to dive into this interview tonight. Oh, I have a lot to tell you about the travels and also the geology that I observed while I was out there in the middle of the Atlantic, and of course, that will be of interest to our geologist extraordinaire, Mr. James Waldo. How are you, my friend? Doing well, guys, and I, I got to be Dead level with you. It seems like it's been about six months since I've been on the mic with you guys. I hate that. I wish it were every couple of weeks or yeah. maybe every couple of days. Maybe one day we'll get to that point. But however often we can do, that's the beautiful thing about the space time travels that we do in the cross time pub. We always reconvene however long the period may appear to be. It seems just like every day that we get together. And in fact, those who are recent discoverers of the, I should say, those who are newly excavating the podcasting world and finding these little buried treasures that are the seven ages audio journal episodes. If you're new to this podcast, it's almost like you do get to hear it every other day until you've gone all the way through the back catalog, but we've got plenty of that available over at seven ages.org and it's about time for us to re up. So here we are yet again, back behind the microphone and doing our due diligence in contributions to our knowledge of the ancient past. So uh, happy New Year, first and foremost. Hope you guys are both ready to kick off 2020 with a bang. Yeah, absolutely. It's a special year, they say, you know, 2020. So we'll see what happens. Things have been eventful so far. That's certainly true. And uh, I'm kind of glad that we've got 2019 and everything that was going on behind us. And I've got my uh, sights on the year ahead, hoping to get out there, volunteer on some more archaeological sites, do what we do every year. But as you guys know, I wrapped up 2019 in a rather unique way. Uh, and listeners of this podcast will be aware of the fact that I spent a little time over in Portugal and the Azores. What an experience. I mean, that was a lot of fun, guys. And the whole time, you know what I was thinking? We should be there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking, why aren't my boys here? I wish you guys had been there. Um, you know, there are so many fantastic museums in Portugal. And so... I read up on all this before I got there, and so after I'm, you know, touching down, my travel companion Jan and I, we get off the plane. We're there in the uh, airport in Lisbon or Lisboa, as they would call it there, and uh, we immediately go over and we get a Lisboa card. This card you can get it for 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever you know period, and it gets you access to all the museums. And so I said, Jan, we've got to get a couple of these. And so we, we got the cards so that when we went around town, any place where you went in, if it was a history museum, archaeology museum, an art museum, you know, if they uh, had a simple Lisboa pass, you go up, you show your pass, and you're right in. And we were able to go into all of these fantastic uh, sites and, and locations, cultural centers and the like. The first place we went to was a museum of modern art in the Baixa district of Lisboa. But then we caught a cab on down and we went to... Uh, the National Archaeological Museum, which was fantastic. They had displays of Roman and Celtic uh, and, of course, Moorish and all kinds of other uh, representations of archaeology indigenous to the region. And and also some things from afar. They had a fantastic Egyptological display uh, there as well. And, of course, a lot of uh, tribute to the Age of Discovery for which Portugal is so well known. But we traveled from Portugal over to the Azores for several days. More on that in a moment. On our way back, we actually flew back from the Azores to Portugal for one night and then came home. And so on our last day in Portugal, Jam wanted to take a nap back at the hotel and I was kind of wandering around and I found yet again another archaeological museum that was in the remains of an old cathedral. And again, it's just so remarkable being able to be in another culture, learning their language. Uh, as I tried to do while I was there. 
and you can probably imagine the important things I learned. Uh, I had to know how to be able to order a coffee, um cafe, or similarly, um imperial or cerveza, you know, which would be imperial is what they call a small beer. Cerveza, very similar to the Spanish, cerveza, you, you can imagine what that is. Uh, but it was just a wonderful experience. You, you learn all the fantastic food as well. Uh, probably one of my favorite things was uh, porco de alentejano, which is this fantastic dish with uh, diced pork and clams that they serve. But again, their culture, their food, and their history. It was quite an experience. But as far as the Azores, you guys know why I was interested in going to the Azores, because you know, there are the ideas, and, and this goes all the way back to Ignatius Donnelly. And in our Lost Coins maps, uh, etc., the Out of Place Artifacts episode that we did a while back, we touched on some of these interesting aspects of the Azores. You know, the account given in the 1700s by Podolin, talking about the discovery of a small vessel of some kind that was revealed as a storm washed away a portion of the uh, beach adjacent to an old building on the island of Corvo there in the Azores. And there were Carthaginian coins dating back to about 200 BC that were allegedly found with that. And in conjunction with that, the discovery of a statue that was pointing off to the west, which may have been depicted on certain portalons and maps uh, prior to the official discovery of the Azores by the Portuguese. And this is very interesting. Again, I would refer the listener back to that episode. We talk in depth about that. But all these things kind of caused me to want to go to the Azores. What I know having been there is first and foremost, if you go in the winter and you want to be able to get around to other islands in the chain, um, you're going to be flying because they don't operate the ferries in the winter. But nonetheless, I was able to correspond with a few scientists, one with the University of the Azores, Felix Rodriguez. He believes that there are petroglyphs on the island of Terceria, which he believes might represent Bronze Age presence on the islands. Uh, Similarly, there are uh, discoveries that he has made, and also another archaeologist named Nuno Ribeiro. Each of them seem to think that these might represent something structures the Romans would have built. And this is really interesting to me because I didn't know this, but a colleague recently brought to my attention that there was a documentary made about some of these already. And in the documentary, they say, you know, why aren't scientists coming out here and looking at these things? And uh, in the documentary, the speaker who is bringing the documentarians out there and showing them these things, presumably on Terceria Island. I haven't watched the documentary myself. I hope to catch up on that. But he says it's because I'm the only one who knows about it. But there were all kinds of interesting things that I learned. A similar story that I was told about an area that I visited in the caldera of a volcano there on Sol Miguel Island where I was staying. We were actually staying down in Ponta Delgada, but I drove up to an area called Seta Cidaj, which means seven cities, and um, you, you drive up into this beautiful scenic landscape and then down into the ancient caldera. And I admittedly, ladies and gents at home, I was sending a video back to Jason and James going, here I am, guys. I'm down in this volcano. Pray for me. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. an active volcano. Everything was okay. But the story that uh, one of my colleagues there on the island, Duerte, told me was that there are scientists there with the university, the main complex of the University of the Azores, small though it is is right there in Ponta Delgada. And they say that they have found evidence in geological surveys where they have actually done core sampling from the base of some lakes in the area. Presumably the lakes that they are talking about are the Laguna Azul and the Laguna Verde, which are two lakes that are actually in the base of the Seta Cidade caldera. But these core samples seem to indicate the discovery of seeds that these scientists believe may have been cultivated which is indicative of early agricultural practices in that region on the island, which yet again seems to predate the Age of Discovery. Now, a lot of this is still, I think, and it has to be pointed out that this is in the area of speculation. But Jason, as I was telling, actually both you guys, because I remained in contact via the World Wide Web with my colleagues, uh, that in itself is kind of fantastic. More on that in a moment, but You know, I was talking to the guys from the bed and breakfast where I was staying there in the Azores, and I mentioned to them, I said, reading of the history, you know, if you look at the period during which these navigators, the Portuguese sailors, began heading west, a reading of the history shows that the Portuguese royalty actually don't instruct them to go out there and see what you might find. They say, go and find the islands. 
And historians have pointed out that it seems that might be significant because it might denote that they had an idea that islands already existed to the West. And surely you do have these mythical tales of Atlantis, you know, and St. Brennan's Isle, the Fortunate Isles. It's not to try and validate those myths so much as to say that those myths might have been based on an actual knowledge of early sailors who had seen those islands. And so it very well may have been that based on what was perceived as mythology at the time, some of the early Portuguese sailors did in fact have knowledge of islands that might have existed to the West, and they went out there not just to see what they could find, but to find those islands, which they did. And so to me, the idea that there might be archaeological evidence predating the official Portuguese discovery is not all that unusual. It's not even all that far out. In fact, it even seems likely, and it seems that there may be mounting archaeological evidence in support of that idea, but we don't leap to that conclusion. We have to see the evidence, right? So that, in summary, was my fantastic uh, Christmas time adventure in the Azores. But again, on the point of technology, one thing that just fascinated me was I'm a Verizon subscriber, and for $10 a day, I was able to get full access to my entire travel plan with my phone. And so wherever I went, I'm able to talk to you guys. I'm in the bottom of a caldera of an ancient volcano and I'm sending, you know, messages to Jason and James. Yeah. You literally messages from the, from the caldera. Yeah. yeah. I, we talked to you every day that you were there. I think. I, I, think. I, I, yeah, I was able to keep in touch like no previous trip I've ever taken. And again, it just reminds me that technology is a wonderful thing. There are, you know, as many drawbacks maybe as there are benefits, but I mean, it's it's really making the world seem so much smaller. And so as we're studying the ancient past, as we're learning things about the world, it's both a fascinating and a, at times a humbling experience to be able to be so connected that I can be traveling. I can be literally in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and I can be like, James, look at this. Yeah. But But one more thing I've got to tell you. The real big takeaway for me was... Uh, in terms of going to the Azores, you expect you're going to be out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and things are going to have a very rustic appeal. I rented a small vehicle and I'm driving along those narrow little European back roads, which is a hair raising experience in itself. And I'm driving along trying to find this little market. Keep in mind, using the Google app on my phone uh, for directional guidance to get there. And I pull up in front of the market and lo and behold, here it is. It's not a market. It's a supermarket. And emblazoned across the side of the building in red letters, it reads Home of the Whopper. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm you, done. Uh, it's like you can't go anywhere and be far enough away from home these days. So that's my trip, yeah, guys. Yeah. I was thinking of you the entire time. And many of you guys out there in the listening audience, too, I wish I could bring you all along. Maybe one day we will. You know, we keep talking about taking the adventure on the road and actually doing a seven ages trip. We'd be interested in hearing from you guys. Why don't you send us an email, Micah, James, or Jason at sevenages.org. Would you like to take a trip with us? Maybe a cruise, maybe some sort of an adventure, an archaeologically themed trip. That'd be a fun thing. And we love doing that research. We'd love to bring you guys along. Let us know if there's a place you'd like to go. And fundamentally, if you'd be interested in going. So speaking of messages from listeners, Charles Reese uh, shot me a note. He said, hi, James. I'm an anthropology student at uh, Western Carolina University with a concentration in archaeology. I was fortunate enough to attend this amazing event a few days ago. I thought this might make some uh, great news for the podcast. The news he was talking about was uh, uh, a campus archaeological facility being dedicated to a former Cherokee village uh, there at Western uh, Carolina University. It's a really good story. It's on uh, on uh, Western Carolina University's webpage. Um, we're going to link that up on the show notes. And, and uh, uh, Charles, I appreciate you sending that in. And uh, anybody else that has a, a tip like that or a good story, please send it in. Absolutely. Always good to hear from Charles, too. Charles has continued to keep in touch with us about his ongoing endeavors in the world of archaeology. And we certainly hope to be able to link up with you at some point, Charles. Thank you uh, and a belated happy holidays to you and a happy new year. Always good to hear from you. Yes, we always enjoy hearing from the listeners. And remember, you can always follow us on our social media accounts at Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And don't forget about our YouTube channel. All of our podcasts get uploaded onto the YouTube channel. And you can also find other videos, documentaries that we've worked on. Uh, those are all great places to keep in touch with us. Uh, we're very active on our social media accounts. So shoot us a message. Absolutely. We have a few irons in the fire in terms of our ongoing documentarian endeavors for 2020. Got to get used to saying that now, guys. And when you're making out your checks and signing documents and things, remember to write 2020. It takes a little muscle memory. It all comes with time. 
And so looking ahead, we're all excited about the new year. All the better reason for us to jump right into this fantastic conversation that we have lined up for you tonight with Dr. Jared Burks, who specializes in geophysical survey technologies and their applications for archaeology. And he has worked an awful lot in an area that is near and dear to our hearts, right up there in Ohio with these remarkable Hopewell and Adena sites and much, much more. We're going to get into all of that with Dr. Burks when we return right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Burks is a professional archaeologist and director of archaeological geophysics at Ohio Valley Archaeology, Inc. in Columbus, Ohio. Jared is also the president and a founder of the Heartland Earthworks Conservancy, which we'll be discussing with him tonight. Jared received his Ph.D. and master's degrees in anthropology with specialty in archaeology, I'll point out, from the Ohio State University and his B.A. degree in anthropology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He specializes in geophysics, non-invasive geosurvey technology and its use in archaeology, as well as Hopewell and other earthwork building groups in the middle Ohio Valley. He employs these skills in research that includes Hopewell settlement practices and locating and studying the layouts of Ohio's many earthwork sites. And so, Dr. Burks, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Uh, my pleasure. Glad to be here. Glad to have you, James. Right out of the box, first question. Dr. Burks, um, with the advent of new technologies, LIDAR, GPR, magnetometry, that kind of thing, can you explain how that's used in modern archaeology? Well, that's a wide range of technologies you just mentioned there, and they all work a little bit differently, but they're all sort of lumped under an umbrella category called remote sensing. So techniques to remotely detect archaeological things. In other words, no digging involved. And uh, so they each work in a little bit different way, but most archaeologists use these different techniques to, one, sort of characterize archaeological sites. In other words, just make maps of them and figure out how they look, what shapes they are. And then, two, the, the things that I do mostly, the like ground-penetrating radar and magnetometry, we use those instruments to look under the ground, so to see things that we can't actually see at the surface. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the time, especially for me, I'm looking for what we call archaeological features um, to, to maybe go and excavate. Absolutely. You know, uh, Dr. Burks, you've surveyed dozens of sites in Ohio. And uh, I'd also like to know, with the location of so many new enclosures that have really drastically altered the existing maps of most of these sites, these existing sites in Ohio, known for a long time, uh, what kinds of additions are typically being made using the technology you just described to these existing maps after geophysical surveying is performed? Uh, So a lot of the maps were made in the 19th century, and in particular, like in the 1830s and 1840s. So... Um, plowing had already started in Ohio by that point. It had already been going for 50 years in some places, maybe even more. And so the earthworks were slowly, you know, uh, melting away beneath the plow. Um, so when these first maps were made, they were the earthworks were still visible mm-hmm. by and large. But um, there's a lot more to these things than what's visible above ground. So uh, the instruments um, have been useful in locating all that stuff that would be below ground, like uh, the foundations of buildings, um, things that were intentionally deconstructed in the past. Um, For example, circles of posts that were stuck in the ground. We call those post circles. Very clever. 
Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, the, the, the biggest thing, both literally and in terms of, um, of excitement value is sometimes we find entirely unknown enclosures, earthen enclosures and, the enclosures consist of usually of ditches dug into the ground and then embankments built up above the ground. And so sometimes those things have become so eroded and filled in that uh, we can't see them anymore at the surface topographically, but the instruments can detect, you know, their footprints and what's left of them below ground. So that's pretty exciting to see that pop up on the screen. Dr. Burks, there's, there's a lot to here to consider. And, and as we think about the earthwork, especially in, in that Ohio area, they're, they're so prominent and it's such a unique feature of, uh, of that area in Ohio. So before we continue with the technology, could you explain to uh, the listeners a little bit more about exactly what an earthwork entails and who are they attributed to? Uh, so as we've just discussed, uh, a lot of these earthworks are um, enclosures uh, and they're of a variety of shapes. Geometric shapes are pretty common, circles and squares. Uh, there's a few octagons and then lots of other weird shapes. Um, and uh, the earthen ones can be, have a ditch and an embankment of earth. Sometimes there's stone uh, in the earthen embankments. Uh, or uh, there are some out there that are just embankments. There's no obvious ditch associated with them. So a lot of them were called forts uh, in the 19th century because they're kind of what you think of a fort should look like a some kind of big wall and a, and a ditch on the outside of it that might even hold water you know to keep people out but a lot of these earthworks in Ohio actually have the ditch on the inside uh, and they they might have actually held water too but that's kind of an odd place to put a defensive ditch on the inside of your embankment if you're trying to keep people out um so right away you know we especially as you got into the 1900s um people began to realize that, you know, these don't make much sense as fortifications. They were probably used for something else. And then, um, especially with the uh, advent of radiocarbon dating around mid-century, uh, we began to realize that they're quite old. Uh, in fact, they're um, 1,600 to 2,000 years old. And uh, a name, a couple names, you know, evolved in, in the archaeological literature to refer to these cultures. And one of them that people might be familiar with is Hopewell. So that, that's the group that made, by and large, most of the enclosures that are in Ohio uh, and elsewhere in the middle Ohio Valley. Um, and before them was a, a group that, at least in Ohio, uh, we refer to as the Adena. And these are terms, they're actually Hopewell's a guy's last name. And Adina is a, a term used by a former governor of Ohio to refer to his estate uh, down in South Central Ohio. Uh, he called it Adina. And um, so they're, they're made up names. Um, and they, they're not really cultures per se, but they refer to this suite of characteristics that are so distinctive in our area, the, the building of big geometric enclosures um, or... Um, or big, tall burial mounds in the case of the Adena. So these enclosure sites are mostly, uh, well, not mostly, but in large part, they're about doing things with the dead. So they do contain burials. So there may be a big circular enclosure, and in the middle of it, um, there could be a mound, and beneath the mound is the foundation of a building, and inside of that building is where the dead may have been cremated, um, you know, ceremonies and rituals took place, uh, and there, those cremated remains may have been collected up and placed in small excavations into the floor of the building. And at some point in the, the history of that building, the, they were done using it, they took the building down or burned it down, and then covered the spot with a mound. Uh, so uh, in addition to mortuary activities dealing with the dead, uh, we imagine that these places were also pretty active gathering places for the living um there are there's often uh, lots of um really fancy objects deposited on the floors of these buildings before they were covered over with mounds and some of these objects um, were made with materials that come from pretty far away from ohio like um fossilized shark's teeth from over you know on the atlantic coast conch shells from the gulf coast uh, obsidian from way out west like uh, yellowstone area and uh, copper 
and other things from the upper Great Lakes. So basically, you know, just draw a big circle around Ohio and stuff is coming from, uh, you know, as much as a thousand or, or even 2000 miles away. Uh, I don't know if you can get 2000 miles away from Ohio and yeah. still be on the continent, but anyhow, you know, <laughs> really darn far away, uh, yeah. 1200, 1500 miles. So how that stuff got here is, is quite the mystery. And, um, it could be a combination of people from here going to get it. Uh, and then, uh, others coming from outside and bringing it and leaving it. Uh, so these earthwork sites, um, are, are pretty, uh, you know, pretty amazing looking, especially to an archeologist. Uh, and they have spawned lots of interesting ideas, you know, about who could have made them and where did they live and all that. And, um, that's sort of the other side of the Hopewell coin is, well, who made them and where do these people live? Uh, and it turns out that that's a really hard thing to answer. Uh, because the folks that built these places and visited them, at least the ones that lived in Ohio, lived in very small settlements. We're talking one or two houses, and they're scattered across the landscape, you know, mostly focused on the river valleys, of course. Uh, and around these houses, they were growing domesticated plants, um, species like uh, goosefoot and um, sunflower and sumpweed and, and stuff like that, things that you don't when you hear those terms, you're like, hmm, yeah, I don't eat that all the time. I feed that to my birds, you know, outside. <laughs> but uh, the goosefoot in particular, you probably have heard of. It's also known as quinoa. So it's a pretty common thing today for people to eat. Um, and uh, it was actually domesticated here in the east, southeastern eastern United States uh, a little bit before the Hopo were building their big mounds and earthworks. Oh, that's fascinating. I actually didn't know that. Yeah, it's um, a couple other species that were domesticated in this region too it's one of those rare places around the planet where it's uh, an independent you know center of plant domestication mm -hmm. so what is it that makes the uh, hopewell earthworks unique among earthworks uh, that's tricky there are lots of earthwork building cultures around the planet you know through time um and uh when you look at hopewell earthworks you know the first thing you think about is oh they have these really interesting shapes like octagons and squares and circles. And some of them are like a thousand feet across or more, which is pretty darn huge. Uh, and you think, well, that must be what makes them unique. And then all you got to do is look to the Brazilian rainforest and you realize, hmm, there's another culture down there making stuff that looks almost exactly the same, <laughs> yeah, uh, but different in, in a variety of ways. Um, but um, it, it may not be the earthworks themselves that make, what the Hopewell accomplished unique. It's what I, I think is really unique about them is the fact that they were, um, the way that the community was organized and their ability to marshal all this labor to build these immense uh, monumental constructions. So here you have this dispersed, these dispersed populations. So they didn't live in cities. Um, they're growing foods that, um, you know, some people regard them as farmers. Um, but maybe horticulturalists or, you know, people with really big gardens is, is a better way to think about it. So they are growing food and they are storing it. And it, it is probably what's getting them through the winter. Um, but uh, perhaps it's creating a surplus, too. They're also doing plenty of hunting and gathering, of course, as well. Um, and uh, they only come together at these earthworks at certain times during the year. Otherwise, they're back home doing their thing. Uh, so. How is it that they were able to, you know, tell everybody, OK, time to go to the earthwork and move some dirt. And then when folks got there, how did they convince them to move, you know, 10,000 dump truck fulls of dirt, one basket at a time uh, to build, you know, one one enclosure, let alone, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of them in Ohio uh, and elsewhere in the middle of Ohio Valley. So um, I think that's what really makes these folks unique is their way of life is not one you think of as having the ability to to make all this stuff work right. and happen. You know? mm -hmm. They didn't have any um, animals that they could use to haul dirt as far as we know. They just had, had their kids and their, <laughs> and their fam family members and uh, their neighbors. Um, they didn't have the wheel, um, no wagons or anything like that. So as far as we can tell, they were... Digging, everybody thinks, you know, they're digging this stuff with sticks. And um, I think that's probably an understatement. I suspect they had 
uh, as sophisticated of digging implements as they needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they may have been made of wood, but, you know, you can use some good hardwoods from Ohio, oaks and whatnot, to make some pretty good digging implements. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And they were packing that dirt into big uh, woven baskets and carting it over to wherever it was they were building these earthworks, you know, on their backs. So um, there have been a few studies done about, you know, how long would it take to build a giant circle a thousand feet across with embankment walls 10 feet high? Uh, and it's like, well, it depends on how many people you have there and, you know, how willing they are to work. Put uh, those youngins to work. That's what I say. Put those youngins to work. We had the opportunity a couple of years ago, uh, the Seven Ages team, to go up to Ohio. And it was the first time we had actually got to see any of these earthworks in person. Now, we had seen the Squire and Davis drawings, and we were familiar with uh, the, the layout of several of them. But we, we got to go to Mound City. And you really can't appreciate how impressive these sites are until you're there and you really uh, you can walk the perimeter. You can see just how structured they are. Um, now, something that we've kind of uh, hinted at here so far is an astronomical alignment uh, ceremonial center. Uh, is there anything that uh, really speaks to that? And can we identify times of the year uh, based off of the alignments that we see? at the sites where they would have gathered for special, uh, whether it be a solstice or an equinox or whatever it may be. Um, let's talk a little bit about the alignments of some of these. And do we know for sure that they were ceremonial centers? Um, well, the, some of them do seem to have alignments um, with various arrangements of gateways and, you know, lengths of wall and such or locations of mounds and how they line up with gateways. And there are most of the alignments are solar alignments. So, as you mentioned, solstices and equinoxes. Um, and then there's there's one really big uh, alignment that's a lunar alignment that you guys have probably heard about. It involves the Newark earthworks. Uh, so this is Ohio's biggest earthwork complex. It's uh, it's now kind of underneath and surrounded by the town of or the city of Newark in Ohio. So that's about uh, 45 minutes east of Columbus. And um, there is uh, Ohio's biggest octagon enclosure, and it's it's connected to a pretty good-sized circu circular earthwork. Um, so we're talking 800, 900 feet across. And in between these two enclosures, there are these parallel embankments of soil connecting them. So it's kind of like walking down the hallway, you know, to get from your your bedroom to the bathroom right. <laughs> you know it's it's this passageway that you walk through it's pretty narrow maybe only you know off the top of my head i can't remember how, exactly how wide it is but um 50 60 70 feet wide this this area in between these embankments and uh, what's really cool is um once every i think it's 18.6 years if you happen to be standing there uh at the right time you'll see the moon come up on the eastern horizon right on that alignment. And you might think, well, of course that's going to happen. You know, to, if you look at the right spot on the eastern horizon and, you know, you can get all kinds of stuff to line up with the moon coming up on the eastern horizon. But it turns out the moon rises um, at a different point on the horizon um, each day. And there's actually a cycle where there's a maximum point maximum point north where where it comes up and a maximum point to the south where it comes up and it cycles back and forth through those points and it takes 18.6 years for that to happen and this enormous earthwork was created um, at least in part if not in whole to observe this rising of the moon on the eastern horizon so um, not only is it not easy to build a giant octagon of earth but it's also lined up in such a way that you can make this observation. So they were good engineers, period, um, working with, with Earth, but they also knew a heck of a lot about what was going on above their heads in the sky. And they knew that the moon had these cycles. Um, it, it's kind of hard for us to think about that because we're always inside at night and we don't watch the sky much anymore. At least most of us don't. But they must have seen it all the time because they didn't have their eyes focused on their cell phones or the television. So I wish um, more of us today, Dr. Burks, yeah, didn't have our right. eyes focused on exclusively on our phones and our televisions. And, you know, the celestial alignments are incredible. And they're merely one aspect of the incredible engineering works that the Hopewell culture 
have been capable of. And in fact, I want to reference something in your paper you co-authored with William Romaine, where you discussed using LIDAR to map the Great Hopewell Road. Uh, You noted in that paper, if I may quote you, uh, using LIDAR imaging, we were able to locate an existing segment of the road in a woodlot north of the Newark Heath Airport. This segment of the walls is known to have existed within the woodlot, but until now, it had not been practical to topographically integrate it with the surrounding landscape. Can you tell us about the structure you're describing there, its use by the Hopewell, and then what LIDAR revealed about it, yet again, using these very recent technologies to see new things about the past? So uh, part of the, some of these large earthwork complexes include um, sets of embankment walls, so pairs of embankments. They're usually three to five feet tall, according to the maps from the 1800s. And, uh, you know, they might be 100 or feet apart or so. And they run off uh, away from the earthworks towards something. Usually they're heading toward a stream. So um, a lot of us think that maybe they're basically um, entryways or entry points or promenades, you know, a way for people to come to the earthwork from. In this case, maybe a stream. Uh, so at Newark, um, there are a set of these parallel embankment walls that come off of the octagon and head sort of south southwest um, toward a stream called Ramp Creek, uh, and it's a it's a pretty long distance. In fact, I think this is the longest distance um, recorded in the Squire and Davis maps uh, of one of these parallel walls going, these parallel sets of walls, and it's something like six miles, I think. So uh, and so those things head south, and then they, they stop at Ramp Creek. Um, and so uh, another archaeologist, who I think you guys have interviewed before, uh, Dr. Brad, Brad Lepper, uh-huh. um, found some archival evidence that suggests that uh, somebody who made some maps of, of the Newark Earthworks was at tracking these walls. And they got to Ramp Creek, and the sky just opened up, and it started pouring rain. And they stopped uh, and went home, you know, smartly. So, <laughs> but they said, and these parallel embankment walls just kept on going on the other side of the creek, all the way to Chillicothe. <laughs> apparently, interesting. Uh, which is which is a heck of a lot of miles. Oh yeah. Uh, so um, the problem is, there's very little evidence for these things south of Ramp Creek. Um, there's very good evidence for them north of Ramp Creek, and you refer to the woodlot in which we detected some remains of the wall. So um, people knew that the the walls may have been partially intact there in the woodlot, but it's a hard spot to get to because it's kind of landlocked. It's it's near the airport, so it's not a place where you know people want you to go a lot because uh, airports are dangerous places for pedestrians to be walking around near. Um, so just not a lot of people knew that it was there. And uh, the great thing about LIDAR is you can sit at home and make maps of things, topographic maps, and you can see really subtle things without even being on the ground. So for uh, those listeners of yours that maybe don't know what LIDAR is, um, this is um, making three-dimensional maps of things, in this case, the surface of the earth using lasers and these lasers are mounted to airplanes um, and the airplanes have fancy gps units to keep track of where they are uh, and they are shooting these laser beams down toward the ground kind of all over the place and they're they're detecting the reflections of the light back up to the airplane uh, and in that way they're making maps you know of what's below below the plane uh, and that has been done to all of ohio um, Ohio was an early state to kind of have the entire state done, which is great for earthwork study. Um, I can sit at home in my PJs and be an armchair archaeologist for hours and hours. <laughs> and uh, uh, a good chunk of these parallel embankment walls um, is visible in the LIDAR data. And, and the best spot is in this woodlot where plowing hasn't hasn't been as pervasive, you know, in this really small woodlot. So. Um, that was pretty exciting to see to see them there. And um, as far as I know, I was just thinking about this the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, this portion of uh, of the Great Hopewell Road, if you will, um, is probably the only area, uh, the only Hopewell earthwork with these parallel embankment walls um, that's still 
visible above ground, still intact. Oh, uh, and and you can see it everywhere else. They they've been plowed away or built over or you know whatever it happened to them. They've been destroyed. So this this may be the only spot where you could you could walk almost literally in the footsteps, you know, of the Hopo folks as they made their journey toward the, the uh, octagon. Quite literally, in fact. We're talking with Jared Burks, a professional archaeologist and, of course, also co-founder of the Heartland Earthworks Conservancy. Jason? As we talk about the advent of these new technologies, I can't help but wonder, uh, on the ground level, how is that affecting archaeology? And what I mean by that is, are we turning more to these type of technologies to discover the past, or is there still a need for the traditional style of excavation? Um, are there any excavations continuing at any of the earthwork sites currently? Hmm. Okay, lots of big questions there. Um, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> there, there will always be a need to excavate. Um, I, I can't imagine a time where that wouldn't <laughs> be a part of archaeology. So these instruments and technologies we've been talking about, LIDAR and magnetometry and such, they remotely sense um, the archaeology. So there are a limited number of things we can learn about the archaeological record with these techniques. I mean, for instance, LIDAR, is it, you're just making a topographic map. So it's what's visible at the surface. People have been doing that forever, you know, saying, right. oh, look, there's a bump over there. I think it might be something of interest. So. The way to make the map is new. That's the LIDAR. Uh, and we can do it across vast areas very quickly and at very high density. Um, but the, the map itself isn't, isn't a new thing. You know? um, the geophysical stuff is a little more new. But um, the, uh, we're, what these things do for us that, that we didn't really have before they came along is they allow us to... So to think more wisely about how we spend our time excavating. So as you can imagine, excavation is is timely, uh, time consuming. So it takes a long time to do it. We happen I mean, to know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, from probably, volunteering. You guys, you guys have done this, so you know yeah. about that. <laughs> um, and uh, it's also expensive because of that. Uh, and it's quite destructive. So. Uh, archaeologists destroy the things that they're trying to study uh, in the process of excavating. So if this, that's why it takes so long. You have to spend all that time documenting what it is you're um, excavating and destroying. Um, so who wants to spend a whole lot of time digging holes uh, and finding nothing? <laughs> um, so a lot of that happened uh, before these kinds of instruments became available. So minimally, geophysical surveys allow us to target our excavation time and money um, at the kinds of things that we really need to examine to, to answer those questions we're asking about the past. Absolutely. Uh, so, th so that's a big game changer. Um, I got into, uh, I, I work in, uh, for this company that you mentioned, Ohio Valley Archaeology, and, and we do contract archaeology or cultural resource management. So we help people um, get uh, permits and, and do things like that to build whatever it is they want to build or are needing to build. Um, and uh, so part of what we do is we try to determine if there are any, quote unquote, significant archaeological resources within the footprint of the things that they want to build or do. <clears throat> and um, determining significance and this is significance in the sense of the of like being listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so there are a set of criteria that you use to evaluate these archaeological sites. And, and one of those, some of those criteria involve knowing if there's any kind of integrity to the ground, you know, the archaeology below ground. Is there anything left of it down there? Has it all been plowed away? Uh, so in order to determine that, you need to dig. Uh, and you need to find some of that stuff and then decide if it's enough to make that site significant. And maybe then the road or the building needs to be moved a little over, you know, so it doesn't impact the archaeology. Well, before, uh, when we did that, before geophysics, um, we would look for artifacts on the surface uh, or within the plow layer. And then um, we would uh, use those results to determine where to do some some test excavations. But... I mean, even on a site as small as a half an acre in size, which is pretty small, um, 
you're likely going to miss the archaeology when you start digging your your small holes because you know there's there, there's so many spots where the archaeology could be within that half acre. Right. Well, with the with the geophysical surveys, we can find the spots where you would want to dig uh, in order to find that cooking pit or that grave or that house foundation. Uh, so it's really changed. It, now, I'm a guy who does this for a living, so of course I'm going to say this, but it's really changed the way that we can do this um, cultural resource management work. And of course, it's also changed um, the way that the academic world works, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's unlikely, I, I would think, that uh, anything would ever really replace uh, good old field archaeology, you know, the way it's always, always been done, um, even with the new technology. But let's shift gears a little bit. Um, why don't you tell us about the uh, Heartland Earthworks Conservancy, what that is, and what the go- what their goals are? So the Heartland Earthworks Conservancy, or HEC as we call it, uh, is a nonprofit entity, and uh, our our missions uh, involve um, researching earthwork sites, documenting them, educating the public about them, and then. Um, also trying to preserve them for the future. So as you probably know, there, Ohio has lots of these places. Um, some est- An early estimate was something like 600 enclosure sites. Well, in fact, it's probably three or four times more than that. Um, there's a lot out there that's not documented. Uh, so um, we go around the state um, especially me, since I have access to these instruments. Uh, and I do surveys on known sites, and I do surveys on sites that have only recently been discovered, uh, and uh, just try to tell everybody about it. And then once in a while, we get the opportunity to use those results to help protect sites, um, like, for instance, for example, purchasing a site to help it become a park or something like that. Uh, so that's sort of the mission of the HEC. We we have a board, and the board consists mostly of archaeologists who are we're all volunteering our time, um, and um, we have a community out there in in the ether who uh, interacts with us via Facebook and um, other social media, and sometimes uh, we meet face to face. And once in a while, we all get to pool our resources together and make a difference by helping buy one of these sites and protect it. So we've had a couple of, I mean, it's, it's so empowering to see this happening, but had a couple of opportunities to engage the public and have them help us uh, purchase, uh, one, you know, one of these, these big earthwork sites. And it's, you wouldn't think it'd be that hard, but some of these places are, um, you know, hundred acres in size. And that's a lot of ground um, in a place like Ohio where, you know, agriculture is king, and um, even agricultural ground is is worth a heck of a lot of money per acre, oh, yeah. uh, let alone ground that's ripe for development. Yeah. So uh, it, it can be hard to to make that happen. Well, you know, so, Dr. Burks, I was reading one of your papers earlier, and you were actually describing a bit of that process and how, you know, you'd begun doing some geophysical surveys on sites, and that led to, I think you said over the course of a couple of short weeks, Reaching out to members of the community, philanthropists, you know, uh, you know, the average citizen who had an interest in this, and and you raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and were able to actually purchase a site. Uh, that's a pretty quick turnaround, and I'd imagine that would be as difficult to try and coordinate, maybe more so than an actual archaeological dig itself. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you guys have been on a couple of digs, so you know that they have lots of moving parts, and there are always things that change so you have to be very flexible and to uh, run a really successful you know large scale excavation project but um these big um acquisition kind of events are are complex in their own ways because no one person can really do it unless you have lots of money yeah uh, and there there are plenty of people that have lots of money they just don't like to spend it <laughs> sure so uh or they they'd rather spend it on other things so it's rare that we get really big donors, you know, who are willing to just buy the entire thing. I got it happens, yeah. but uh, so we have to try to piece it all together in, in other ways, and that involves lots of partners, partnering mm-hmm. organizations, and um, I, we've been involved in a few acquisitions where, you know, it looks like there ain't no way it's going to happen, and then 
two hours later, somebody found a way, you know, the, yeah. to, to make it happen. So it's all about networking uh, and being in contact with the kinds of people who are motivated and dedicated to land conservation. Um, and uh, it's also a lot about being in touch with the public and trying to find all those people who have a little bit of interest in in saving the pasts, you know, for the future or in studying the past to so just to learn about people. I mean, we're all humans. So yeah, these we were all. humans 2000 years ago doing this stuff. What motivated them? You know, what, what were they thinking about? Did they love their kids? Uh, I don't know, you know, all the same kinds of questions we have today. Hopefully we shared uh, a lot of those ideals with them. And, you know, briefly, I, I want to toss it back over to Jason, but I have to reference something about the paper uh, in which you were describing that process of, you know, acquiring those funds and preserving these heritage sites, because that's such a fundamentally important part of what we do. But from time to time, we also find very unique things at these locations. And as much of your work deals with the geophysics of archaeology and that side of things, uh, the particular paper I've been reading had to d do with the detection of lightning strikes on earthwork sites. Can we discuss lightning strike anomalies in relation to some Ohio archaeological sites really quickly? Sure. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, let's let's hear about those lightning strike anomalies, because there was a recent news item that the BBC carried where a similar what appeared to be a repetitive lightning strike occurred at a, a stone circle in Scotland. And it seemed to indicate that perhaps ancient people were drawn to the fact that the lightning strikes occurred there. Uh, it would only stand to reason if they were watching the sky at night that probably ancient people were also paying attention to other atmospheric phenomena and things like that. But I just wonder when we talk about those anomalies, are these repetitious strikes in the paper you reference uh, the fact that these appear to have been recently and that actually they were not, they were subsurface just right below the ground, I believe, the, the origin point of the anomaly and actually seem to be concomitant with, if memory serves, agricultural activity in that area. But maybe you can elaborate on that. What was the nature of the anomaly and why did that occur and how were you able to detect it? Uh, so this is using a magnetometer. And uh, as you probably know, when, when lightning happens, there's a lot of current that flows around, electrical current. Uh, and when electricity flows, it creates a magnetic field. So um, that's what's happening in this case. Um, electricity is flowing between the ground and the sky. And as it's flowing through the ground, um, it's creating a very strong magnetic field, and that's permanently magnetizing the ground around it. Uh, and so it's not it's not burning the ground it's it's magnetizing the ground through this electromagnetic process and so uh, electricity tends to flow um, you know in in the path of least resistance literally uh, and uh, for uh, apparently for a lot of lightning strikes that means pretty close to the surface and the reason we know this is because um, a lot of these um, magnetic anomalies that are created in the soil by by the lightning strikes and they they they're kind of long and narrow mm -hmm. and um they line up with the path of plowing in these agricultural fields oh, okay so um it's pretty easy to see um because a i can detect the plow marks and the magnetic data and then b you see these lightning strikes and they're lined up on you know on the same path um so um you know that they must be traveling near enough to the surface that whatever the plowing is doing to enhance, you know, the, the ground for electricity to flow. And I suspect that it's funneling moisture, you know, down into the bottom of the plow furrow and uh, electricity likes to flow through that moisture. Right. Um, it's got to be fairly close to the ground. So one of the things I've noticed over the years, I've had the chance to work a lot at a place called Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. Mm -hmm. It's in South Central Ohio. There's, some big earthwork sites there, Hope All Earthworks, and various uh, the the various components of the park are were assembled from old agricultural fields, and uh, as soon as they were purchased, they were taken out of plowing, and plowing stopped. Um, and and one thing I noticed was uh, it seemed like some of the uh, parts of the park that had been parked longer had more lightning strikes in them, and. Uh, you know, the newer parts of the park had fewer lightning strikes. Oh, okay. And, and I thought, hmm, I wonder what that means. Uh, and then uh, it all kind of came to a head when I was, I was doing some survey work at a, a site called the Junction 
uh, group Earthworks. Um, it's one of those sites that that the community banded together and helped to purchase back in 2014. Uh, and once once it was bought, um, I went out there and did another magnetic survey. So I'd surveyed it first in in 2005 and six, and that's the results of that were so compelling. That's what we used to convince people this place was worth saving because you couldn't see it at the surface at all if you were standing out there. But it was clear as day in, in the magnetic huh. map. Uh-huh. Uh, so there was obviously something still there underground. Uh, and in the new magnetic map, so this would be not even 10 years later, there was a new lightning strike that wasn't there uh, the first time I had surveyed it. Mm. And this new lightning strike was lined up with the direction of plowing. Uh, so it had, you know, it had hit um, and followed one of these plow marks. And when I saw that, I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, at first I said, well, why did it travel that way? And then, uh, you know, it dawned on me, oh, it's following the same path that the plow marks are following. And so then I went back and started to look at other data sets that I had. And it's like, hey, look, all these other ones, <laughs> they also follow the direction of plowing. And and uh, there was another another site there uh, within the park, Hopal, uh, Hopal Mound Group, where there were two fields side by side and the plow direction was was different in each field and the lightning strikes were oriented differently in each field to follow the plow mark. So, you know, when you do enough of these, eventually you realize, oh, yeah, that's no brainer. I mean, the, the pattern's very consistent. Um, so, um, so that's a good sign. And then um, when you start looking closely at these sort of intact lightning strikes in, in the magnetic data uh, and you study them a little bit and figure out what, makes them tick you know their shape and how magnetic they are and how the magnetism changes with the distance from the point where the the electricity um, came into or left the ground Um, and then you think about how deep they are and and how long this has been happening right for thousands of years yeah um, it it stands to reason that plowing has also probably destroyed a gazillion of these things um, and that maybe it hasn't completely destroyed them maybe there are little parts of them that are still left and we often find these kind of large and explicable magnetic things uh, in some of our surveys. And um, as I started looking at those, I was like, oh, you know what? Those are the remnants of lightning strikes that haven't been quite erased by plowing. So they're maybe a little bit too deep, um, you know, to be hit by the plow. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that's what the lightning is all about. Now, the question uh, you're probably thinking is, well, did they build these earthworks, you know, right where the lightning was striking? Um, if I'm sure you guys live in areas where you have thunderstorms and you have lightning and you know that some of those storms get pretty busy with lightning and it is everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, um, my, um, when I heard about the story you mentioned, uh, over in Ireland, that this site that had, I think it had two lightning strikes. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, one of these earthwork sites, um, in Southern Ohio that I surveyed, it has like a hundred lightning strikes wow now did i get all excited and go to the bbc and say my god they built this earthwork to (laughs) conduct electricity no because there are lightning strikes everywhere Mm -hmm. um and so what i would say to those researchers i didn't read the bbc article so maybe they addressed this but um i would say have you surveyed outside the earthwork or the the stone circle or whatever it is important you know to see if there are other lightning strikes around And it also would stand to reason, I guess, if you're if you're noting that uh, the the movement of the ground that occurs when these sorts of plowing and agricultural processes occur, if that influences lightning, it would stand to reason that earthworks themselves in their construction might also uh, shape and change the texture of the ground in such ways that allow those moisture pockets that might also be conducive to lightning strikes. Am I am I correct in my interpretation there? Right. So. Um don't think of the the plowing or the earthworks as attracting lightning, um, of course, but be thinking that lightning happens right? yeah. it, it, all the time. It has for thousands of years. It's going to happen, and electricity is going to flow through the ground, and it's going to flow through the most conductive path in that area because mm-hmm. that's what it does. Uh, so if there happens to be something that's causing you know, that conductive path to be in a particular spot, then lightning is going to favor that spot. So in a plowed field, it, it's probably the plowing itself that's doing it. When it comes to earthworks, I have detected one so far um, that I can think of off the top of my head where the 
a lightning strike has followed the embankment wall. Uh, and um, oftentimes embankment walls are built with clay. And as you know, clay can hold moisture better than some other soils. So, um, and some clays are quite conductive. So right. uh, it could be that the embankment wall is just a bit more conductive than the ground around it. So, and of course it was a little bit taller too. So the uh, electricity filed the embankment wall. Um, so just, you know, by dumb luck, lightning struck, you know, right, right at the embankment wall. Um, and and voila, we have ourselves a lightning strike that's you know on the embankment. I see. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I think that that phenomenon is is truly fascinating, and I think it's certainly not something that you normally discuss or hear about with archaeological sites. But as we're nearing the end here, no conversation on Ohio archaeology and earthworks would be complete without touching on the Serpent Mound. So, yeah. of course, you know, uh, it's iconic, it's internationally known, even if people aren't familiar with uh, the other major Hopewell sites, most people know about the Serpent Mound. So I want to begin with that particular er earthwork, because that is not associated with the Hopewell culture. Is that correct? Correct. And so the controversy surrounding that one is always who made it? Was it the Adena? Was it a Fort Ancient culture? What insight can you provide on who might have actually created the Serpent Mound? Man, you just cut right to the chase, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, as it turns out, is quite the debate at the moment um, because it is very tricky to date earthen embankments. Um, so not just Serpent Mound, but all earthworks are pretty hard to date because um, oftentimes the embankments themselves um, don't contain materials, you know, that date to the time when the embankment was built. So uh, the embankments are are made with soil, and the soil is dug from somewhere and then piled up somewhere else. Uh, so we, the uh, the soil uh, where it's dug from can contain all manner of stuff from any time before that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it could just be there naturally in the soil. So. Uh, <clears throat> That's the trouble with dating earthworks um, is you just don't know where the stuff in the embankment comes from and how long it's been there. Uh, so the challenge with Serpent Mound is it's an embankment and it's sitting on the surface and it's made with dirt from somewhere. And uh, up there on that landform where the serpent is, um, just off the tail of the serpent, is a settlement created by a group that we call the Fort Ancient. Uh, and they lived in Ohio from about A.D. 1000 to A.D. 1650. Um, and uh, so you've got an embankment uh, and you've got a village site over there. Um, and uh, these Fort Ancient villages were usually had lots of people in them. They're very busy places, people burning wood constantly all the time. Uh, so there's lots of charcoal floating around within and near these ancient village sites and and you know charcoal has a way of moving around within the soil it can um as worms and critters and tree roots dig their way down into the ground charcoal can move down downward uh, or as trees tip and and their roots pull up soil um, charcoal can get ripped out of the ground and be thrown upwards uh, you know and make its way back onto the surface so um we have we have that challenge there uh, and and then um, very few people have ever excavated into the serpent itself. Uh, so as you guys have probably heard, the, there were some excavations done there by Harvard University uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, and they dug a lot of the park around the serpent. And they dug into this village, too, this Fort Ancient village. And they found cooking pits and burials and house patterns and you know, all the kind of stuff we usually find at these places. Uh, but they didn't find a whole lot in the serpent. Uh, so for the longest time, we just didn't know who built the serpent or when. But people speculated that, hey, it's an embankment. Stands to reason that other groups that built embankments might have been responsible for this embankment. Uh, you know, kind of logical. Uh, and um, over time, um, archaeologists in Ohio um, began to realize that there was there were these two groups that built earthen embankments, a lot of them, all over the middle Ohio Valley, and, and that's the Hopewell and the Adena. Uh, the Hopewell usually built 
big circles and squares and things like that. Um, the Adena um, were more noted for building conical burial mounds, uh, and there is a conical burial mound not far from the serpent. Indeed, we've been there and seen that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, there you go. I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't take much of a leap in logic to uh, speculate that, hey, you know, there's a burial mound here. Um, this is an earthwork. Maybe it's an earthwork building culture that built this. Let, you know, let's, let's go with Adena. Right. I mean, it makes uh, sense logically that with the proximity to an Adena mound, that that might have been the, the mode of construction and the group that had done it. But, uh, and I'm sure that we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I do want to reference the 2014 paper that you co-authored with Ed Herman, uh, Bill Romain et al. This was titled A New Multistage Construction Chronology for the Great Serpent Mound USA, because like you mentioned, there's been a bit of back and forth about this. And in that paper, you argue that based on the geophysics that you use to map the mound and solid earth cores to provide accurate stratigraphy and organic samples for carbon-14 age estimates from the base of the mound, and analyses that you conducted thereafter, you guess that really the Serpent Mound probably is in excess of a couple of thousand years old and actually probably does ba- date back to the early woodland period, which would be concomitant with the Adena. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So there's a little more to this story, okay. of course. Yeah, please, please, go ahead. Uh, in, in the mid-90s, uh, so up until the mid-90s, everybody thought, oh, Adina, yep, server mound built by the Adina, and uh, all the books said that, and so on. And, and then in the mid-1990s or so, early 90s, mid-90s, um, some archaeologists got together uh, and decided to test that idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they reopened one of Harvard's excavation trenches in the mound, Clean back the excavate, you know, the, the profile wall there to get to some some unmolested soil uh, within the serpent, and they found some charcoal. Yeah, uh, and a number of pieces of charcoal at different depths within within the serpent, and they had it radiocarbon dated. And wouldn't you know, it a, a couple of samples dated to about a thousand A.D., yeah. which is way after the Adena. Oh yeah. And it's the same time as the Fort Ancient, which, uh, as luck would have it, uh, lived right next to the serpent <laughs> in a little settlement. Um, so uh, uh, a journal article was written, and now people were starting to wonder, hmm, maybe the serpent isn't as old as we thought. But for, um, for a lot of us, um, it just didn't make too much sense because... There, just, there aren't any other earthworks like that in Ohio that are that age. In fact, there really aren't any other earthworks like Serpent Mound anywhere um, in Ohio. Um, there's one other earthwork shaped like an animal, uh, so an effigy earthwork. Uh, it's kind of up near Newark, so um, it's about a two and a half or two and a half hours away or so by car. So it's pretty far away, uh, and it's not shaped like a serpent. Um, so what the heck, why, why is there only one? Uh, and so that those dates kind of bugged people that that they just didn't make any sense. So, uh, we, we just didn't really know how to go about testing this, um, without digging big holes in the serpent, uh, until we, um, um, kind of put together a team uh, of soil scientists and archaeologists and me doing some geophysics. Uh, and so we came up with this idea that we would survey the serpent uh, with magnetics and whatever other instruments I could throw at it. And then we would take these cores. So we'd punch a, a really small hole into the top of the serpent and go down all the way through it and into the ground below it, pull up the soil, and then look at the soil to try to understand how the serpent was built uh, with what dirt and uh, see if we couldn't find some charcoal from various depths uh, within the serpent. And lo and behold, um, we found charcoal at the base of the serpent, and it might even have been below the serpent, in several places, ran radiocarbon dates on it, uh, and got quite a few dates that all hovered around 300 BC, which is square in the Adena time period, so that early woodland period. So we do know, uh, and we didn't get any other dates. That's the that's a key, I think, to the uh, uh, part of our argument is we got a bunch of these dates that, that go to 300 BC, but we didn't get 
like a stray for ancient data or a little bit of hope all data in there or, or anything else really that was just that so you know one could argue that um maybe something happened to cover that spot so that no other charcoal could accumulate there in the next 2000 years and hey look maybe somebody built a serpent mound on top of it you know to to keep charcoal from going in there so we used that as part of the argument but we didn't want to just discard what the uh, previous archaeologists had done in the sure. 1990s because they had done good research uh, and obviously there's charcoal in the serpent that dates to AD 1000 mm -hmm. so how do you explain that uh Although one so, interpretation, yeah, I guess, or, would be that, I mean, obviously many different cultures might have existed or coexisted alongside the Serpent Mound. And I guess I, I might have even been Brad Lepper that brought this up when we spoke with him, the idea that there's almost a sort of curation, you know, that some of these existing earthen works, if they date back to earlier times, they might go through periods of what you might call, um, if not curation, the, the uh, subsequent cultures are stewards to it and they might improve or renovate some of those earthworks i mean is that possible sure and um that's what we argued in in our paper that um and in fact uh, we had uh, a couple of lines of evidence to argue this well a the radiocarbon dates uh, but b uh, in the magnetic survey uh, i detected what looks to be a part of the serpent that's been erased uh, right in the past mm -hmm. so uh, we ended up calling it the stealth coil because uh, <laughs> it's this this loop of of this serpent, and it it looks so much like the rest of the serpent. It's hard to imagine it being anything else. Oh, absolutely! Uh, and, and in it's fact, the we... right size, right shape, and all that stuff. And, yeah, um, it looks like somebody changed the serpent at some point in the past. So we did some excavation on a little bit of it. There is some soil there that's a little bit unusual. It's what's causing the magnetic signature. And it looks like um, it's material that was underneath the original, you know, stealth coil of the serpent that was then erased. And, um, so was it, you know, we've talked about radiocarbon dating, but there's there's other dating techniques that could be used, I suppose. But uh, the one that I was I was thinking about as you were talking was OSL. And I don't know if this type of sediment um, lends itself to to that type of dating technique and i don't know if anybody's considered that or if it's been done i just was curious uh, about that. oh yeah um so uh these these uh dates that we got um for the, and then got published in that 2014 paper um, they sparked uh quite a debate and uh that has um led others to start thinking about you know independent ways of dating this and, and i'm all for it um it's my opinion that um you know, the more dates you run on Serpent Mound, the more different um, results you're going to get back, probably. Huh. You know, there must be, you know, millions of pieces of charcoal in that embankment. And um, who knows which one is going to give you the right answer. So we we need more dates. And we we should probably get some other techniques that don't rely on charcoal. And OSL dating is a good one. Uh, uh, and um, I know Brad Lepper's been involved in, in some of this research and and he's been trying to attract people to, to, to become part of a research team that would do that, but it's expensive. Sure. Uh, and, um, and it's a little bit destructive because you have to, you know, go down into the soil and get it, get these samples, uh, for the testing. And, um, so it's, it's not something you can do lightly. Yeah. Talking about the, the evolution of the site for a moment. Um, I remember specifically reading something that mentioned that it's no longer visible, but they were also next to the head on either side of the body. Uh, there appears to be what we would look at as wings. Uh, is that is that accurate? Uh, that are so no longer part of the actual structure. On, yeah, it depends on who you read. <laughs> so um, in the in the eighteen hundreds, there were a range. So these things disappeared in the eighteen hundreds. They were only visible back then. They're not visible now. Uh, and they haven't been seen for, for over 100 years, I don't think. Yeah, over 100 years. And so uh, they have been interpreted as the legs of a frog that's in a serpent's mouth, uh, or they have been interpreted as the horns of a horned serpent, uh, or wings or feathers coming off the head of the serpent for a feathered serpent. 
you know, so uh, there there seem to have possibly been some minor embankment walls there um, near the head of the serpent. Um, exactly what they are, you know, or were, we don't know because they're just not around anymore. Uh, and it's also, a, it's kind of a busy spot. So the ground's been kind of altered there. Now, there could be stuff below the walkway still, but doing archaeology there would be um, challenging. Uh, right. And, and you know, with all the mysteries that surround it, uh, I understand that not only is it um, a, a huge part of Ohio archaeology, but it has sort of adopted this uh, fringe or alternate alternative history sort of attraction to it. Um, have you experienced any of that on the site? Uh, I've heard <laughs> stories of people trying to bury crystals in the body of the serpent and various <laughs> different things. Um, have there, has that been an issue as far as destruction of the, of the site itself? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm not sure why people think that they, um, they can just go to a place like that and dig holes in it um, without permission, but they do. Uh, and people, people have dug holes in the head of the serpent to, to like place candles in the ground, you know, pretty good sized holes too. Uh, there have been these strange little um, resin objects placed all over the, the serpent and in little holes in the serpent. There have been lots of bizarre things that have happened there. Well, while we were there um, doing the magnetic survey on the serpent itself, um, I can remember when I'm collecting magnetic data, you know, I'm just walking back and forth a lot with the instrument. It can get kind of boring. So, you know, I look around, I talk to people, and um, I noticed there are a number of people walking around and they were holding their hands up in front of their, kind of in front of their face with the palms pointing outward. Uh, and I noticed some of them doing it on the on the ground and they would point in toward the serpent. And then there were some people doing it while standing up in the observation tower and they're pointing it toward the serpent. And I thought, hmm, there must be a story here that I, that I don't know. <laughs> so uh, um, like a day or two later, um, a woman walked by me and she asked me what I was doing. Uh, I said, oh, I'm doing an archaeological survey um, with this magnetometer. We're trying to you know, look for things um, below ground, maybe parts of the serpent that people didn't know about. She's like, oh, um, I don't need no fancy instrument to do that. And then she held up her hands. I can do them with these. <laughs> so uh, apparently um, there um, are folks out there who can who like to go to the site and um, try to sense special properties, you know, of, of the place um, with their own bodies. And I don't think that's uncommon throughout the world for people to want to try to do that. <laughs> Um, as far as I know, you know, I mean, like geophysically speaking, um, there was nothing weird about the magnetic data I got at the serpent versus anywhere else in Ohio or the world where I've done magnetic surveys. Um, there are people that talk about how sometimes um, the battery in their there there have been instances where people say the battery charge in their car has been drained by some mysterious process. You know, well, that has nothing to do with Serpent Mound. That's the UFOs. Oh, OK. Well, or just like leaving your headlights on, perhaps. But, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, people usually at places that are special, like Serpent, um, you get all kinds of of interesting ideas about special properties and why people chose the spot. And of course, I'm a scientist. I'm very boring. I usually start with, well, um, it's just here. Somebody decided we're going to build it here. There's nothing super special about this spot. This is where it ended up because stuff has to end up somewhere. Uh, and maybe it is just so mysterious. They just, this is where they lived and they decided to build it here. I don't know for sure. But um, the, the other thing about Serpent Mound is that it's actually inside, uh, you know, a, a, an impact, impact crater. crater. Yeah. A very, very old one. We're talking 330 million year old. The kind of thing that killed the dinosaurs. Well, it hit hit the earth mm. right about where the serpent mound is. This serpent is inside of it. Um, right. And it's, it's a very big one, like eight or nine kilometers across. So you can't see it from the serpent. Now, if you look in the LIDAR data um, across a big area around there, you might be able to pick it out if you know it's there, but it's incredibly eroded. Um, yeah. So unless you're a geologist um, or you're doing like a, you know, some, some sort of geophysics at the earth scale, you know, like 
um, doing some kind of gravity measurements or something. I don't know. Um, it's unlikely that you'd even know that thing is there because it looks just like everywhere else around. You know, there are a lot of different reasons why these things might have ended up where they ended up. Yeah. And look, you know, not taking anything away from people's religion or their spirituality. If that's how you choose to practice, that's fine. Whatever you believe in, no problem there. But you cannot go to a site and burn candles. You cannot right. dig holes into a site. You cannot be disrespectful of the site. Um, there's yeah. only one serpent mound. And, you know, everybody has a, a part in playing, keeping it safe, keeping it for the next generation. So if you are listening and, and those are things that you practice, that's fine. But you cannot go in and destroy a site. No, uh, it's yeah, it's 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 unfortunate that people think that they ha they can do that um, because if everybody thought that way, there'd be nothing left. Uh, it'd all be destroyed. Um, so the idea is to keep serpent special for everybody um, by not uh, molesting it. Um, you can go there and you can experience plays. You can look at it. Just don't change it. And I don't think you could put it any better than that. Dr. Burks, thank you so much for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. In closing, how can people contact you and how can they participate in the preservation of the earthworks? Well, I think uh, one great way to help out with earthwork preservation is go visit earthwork sites. There are quite a few parks around southern Ohio and, and elsewhere in the Ohio Valley. And helping support these places um, helps to protect the earthwork sites. Um, get involved with organizations like uh, the one that, that I help out with, the Heartland Earthworks Conservancy. We have like a Facebook page that people can go visit, and, and we try to distribute information about things we learn about earthworks, but also opportunities um, that people can get involved with to help protect them, either in purchasing them or volunteering their time to, to help um, clean places up, that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, just start. Um, searching for these earthwork sites on, on the internet. Um, go visit them in the parks and get involved in social media surrounding these things and uh, I think you'll come across lots of opportunities to, to get involved. Special thanks again to Dr. Burks for joining us tonight. Fantastic conversation, and it's always fun to discuss the Serpent Mound, one of my favorite places. You know, if we ever get back up there, my good pal Nicole keeps saying, I want to come out and meet you guys there. In fact, I think a lot of folks probably would. It's probably high time that we make another trip up that way, guys. And of course, while we're thanking all the fine folks out there who listen to this program, I do have to mention a couple of you guys out there. Eric Eads who sent along a $10 donation and a quick note, love the show. Thanks. Well, thank you, Eric. We appreciate you and all you guys. If you would like to support the program, just head over to sevenages.org. Right there on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a button that you can click that allows you to send a donation through PayPal. Remember, you don't have to have a PayPal account, but you can use a debit card if you'd like to make a donation through the PayPal portal. That'll work just as well. And we also have uh, Joan who sent along the following email, which I wanted to read. Uh, I always appreciate thoughtful messages that we receive from our listenership, and this is really a great one, I think, uh, to set a precedent for the new year. She writes, Thank you for the wonderful podcast discussion with Dr. Bruce Bradley, which came out in August, but which I just listened to in the past couple of days. Despite my interest in American archaeology, my only previous exposure to the Salutrian hypothesis had been through various podcasts, in which the idea had been roundly and repeatedly dismissed as lacking in evidence and abounding in racism, at least in its popularly disseminated outline. It was enlightening to hear from Dr. Bradley himself and to learn more about the idea in its original form, derived from experience interpreted by scholars with no axe to grind but a desire to examine the evidence, and the evidence would appear to deserve more study. Of course, I completely agree with Dr. Bradley Lepper, whom I've heard speak multiple times. I live in central Ohio, fortunate because we were just discussing that with our guest. And of course, Dr. Lepper has said many times, according to our author here, that racism has no place in proper scientific research. I think all of us completely 100% agree 
and commend Dr. Leper for saying that, but our author of the email here goes on to say, neither does hysteria, especially when it causes generalized fear to legitimate would-be researchers and persuades them to avoid certain paths of inquiry. And she notes here, a similar set of imposed blinders, of course, exists in any academic consideration of what would be called paranormal, but that's a whole nother can of worms. I'm 66 years old and immensely tired of the nasty screaming that seems to have taken place of the reasoned discussion in all spheres, scientific as well as political. Your podcast was terrifically enlightening, and I thank you and your crew for it. Joan from Ohio. Joan, thank you so much. And I couldn't imagine a better episode to read this email on in light of what we just discussed. Uh, Ohio is a very special place to us, and having spent a lot of time there, we're very aware, I think, of the pseudo-archaeological interpretations and the sort of, I think, what uh, Dr. Kenneth Fetter has referred to as mystical interpretations of a lot of those sites. It's important that we apply archaeology and science and logic and reason to our understanding of the past, but also we want to allow for people to be able to choose what they believe and not offend somebody if their belief system differs from our own. We always like to proceed with respect, not with snark. But on this program, we do like to highlight scientific achievements, and it is important if an idea, even if it's unpopular or if it has become unfairly stigmatized, but there is science in support of it, we feel it is important to discuss those things too. And Dr. Bruce Bradley never seems to be able to really get a fair shake when it comes to that kind of dialogue. You often don't see him quoted or part of the discussion when those attacks against his ideas occur. And so, again, kudos to Jason Pentrail. Uh, for arranging for that interview for us and allowing us to actually have that conversation with him. And of course, as always, we will air to the judgment of our friends in the archaeological community, disciplined scientists, and those who are out there conducting the real research. We'll wait and see where the science takes us, and hopefully without any kind of biases or prejudices, and a clear-minded approach in the spirit of true science and discovery. So, Anyway, enough pontificating. Guys, as always, it is fantastic to be able to be behind the mic with you. Thanks again to Dr. Jared Burks for joining us as our guest. And I think it's about time for us to re-up one more time here at the Cross Time Pub. What do you think? I say you talk me into it. Let's do it. Let's do it indeed. James Waldo, team geologist, our environmental scientist, Jason Pintrail, and I am yours truly, Micah Hanks, the dedicated amateur in our midst. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates. Thanks to all you guys out there for following our work and supporting what we do. Head over to sevenages.org to find out more about all of our endeavors, and we will catch you guys again next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm-hmm.